You know, I got the call Thursday about uh, Christy Goolsby. Uh, and of course, that's uh, some heartbreaking news. Can you imagine what she's dealing with on her way to see her mother that has just been diagnosed with cancer and then she herself uh, is involved in a head-on collision with another vehicle. Uh, it's a very, a very tragic time for this family. And so if you would, please be praying for them. And as a matter of fact, if you wouldn't mind, let's go ahead and let's, uh, let's go to the throne room of God right now together. Holy Father, thank you so much for your love. Thank you so much for your care. Thank you so much for your watchfulness over us every day. God, we know that there are hearts hurting right now, Father. Brother Robert and his family, uh, the family of Christie, we just pray for them at this time. God, we can't imagine what it is that they're having to go through. God, we just pray that you will heal. Uh, God, not only physically, but God, emotionally, we pray that you will just be a part of that situation. And God, we know that human hands only go so far, and then comes you, and comes your will. God, we pray again that you will be with this family. For God, we know that you are the one who is able to do all things. God, help us as, as your church to do our part, to reach out, to be the best encouragement that we can comfort. And God, we pray that you will do the same as well, Father, in a way that we know, God, that only you are able to do. We love you. We praise you. We thank you so much for loving us. And it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> you know, Revelation class on Wednesday night has been excellent. Amen. It's been excellent. I have absolutely enjoyed that more than I could ever uh, express. You know, Curtis says something here, I think it's been last week, maybe it was the week before, I think it was last week though, that really caught my attention. The, the class itself has had me thinking about a lot of different things, but this thing in particular stuck out to me. You know, in Revelation chapter 2 and verse 1, it talks about the one who walks among the seven golden lampstands. The idea is that Jesus is in His church. Jesus is dwells among His church. The church is in the presence of Jesus. And as I got to thinking about the idea that Jesus is in His church and that to be in the church, that to be together with the church is to be in the very presence, to stand before Almighty God and Jesus Christ Himself. And as I thought about that, I came to a couple of conclusions. You know, uh, I've been preaching through the book of Psalms lately. I think this will be my uh, seven or eighth sermon in a row that's been from the book of Psalms. And this idea falls right along with the Psalms. It's basically the same question uh, that David asked in Psalm 15. God, who may abide in your tent and who may dwell on your holy hill? The question he's essentially asking is, God, who may be in your tent? Presence, And then he begins to list, by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, all of these things that we must be in order to truly stand in the presence of Almighty God. And when I put all of that together, I ask myself this question. If every single time the church assembles, if Jesus is there, if Jesus is dwelling among His church, and He sees everything that we as the body do. Is He pleased? Think about that question for a moment. Every time you and I get together to worship, Jesus sees all. We know that God sees all, and we're going to talk about that point a little more here in just a little bit. But the fact that you right now this morning stand in the presence of holy Almighty God. Is He pleased with our worship? Is He pleased with the way that we sing? Is He pleased with the way our men go about leading prayers? Is He pleased with the way that we give? Is He pleased with our attitude? Is He pleased with our mindset? Is God pleased? Is Jesus Christ pleased? Because you see, Jesus died for the church, and that shows me one thing, that He loves it more than we could ever imagine. And knowing how much Jesus loves the church, Jesus wants nothing more than for the church to succeed and for the church to be doing all that He died and created it and established it to do. Is God pleased with our worship? Every time we're together, 
and we go about our worship, is He happy? Is He pleased? You know, we allude to John chapter 4 and verse 24 where Jesus is having a conversation with a Samaritan woman there. And they're talking about all sorts of things. And she asks the question, where is the best, where is, should we worship? You Jews say that it's up on the mountain. And they're just having this conversation. And Jesus says, truly I say unto you, a time is coming when the worshipers of God will worship Him in spirit and in truth. You know, I was raised in the church. And I'm very blessed. I come from a family who were uh, nearly all members of the church on both sides. My mom's side and my dad's side. Nearly all of the family are members of the Lord's church. I'm very, very fortunate. And having grown up in the Lord's church, I've, I've seen a lot of things. Something I want to mention is the fact that we do a really, really good job of speaking about the will of God and the pattern of worship for His church from a doctrinal standpoint. Do you understand what I'm saying? We are really good at defending doctrine, about defending the way that we teach and the way that we worship. We're really, really good about those doctrinal things and about the truth but sometimes I still really feel like we're lacking in teaching the spirit of New Testament Christianity. There's a certain spirit about the worshipers of God. There's a certain spirit that we are expected to have. And folks, if we don't have it, why are we here? If we don't have the right spirit, the right mindset, the right attitude, if we're going about our worship the wrong way, then it's meaningless. As Solomon would put it, it's vanity. All is vanity. It is vain. And so as we are thinking about our lesson this morning, nine reasons to praise God in worship. If you're one of those that you're having a hard time finding that motivation, if you're one that is having a hard time uh, finding the motivation to give everything that you have and to worship with all of your heart every single time that you're here, this lesson is for you specifically. As if we don't have enough motivation anyway. You know the book of Galatians in the latter portion of the book talks about our motivation for serving. And our motivation for serving being the cross itself and how true that is. That is our motivation. But today I want to look even further than the cross, see, the before, the after of the cross. From Psalm 147, nine reasons to praise God in worship. Well, you know what it means to praise. The idea of emptying yourself to give God everything that you have. My whole life I was taught that I should leave worship full because worship should fill you up. I would say the very opposite, that worship should empty you that every single time you leave the church building that you should be empty because you've given God absolutely everything that there is to give and you have nothing left. And then you recharge and we do it all over again on Sunday night. Nine reasons to praise God in worship today. You know, worship, and I know I'll get to point number one in a minute. As I think about worship, I've studied with a lot of people who feel like worship all worship is pleasing and acceptable to God. That it doesn't matter how you worship as long as you worship. And God is just pleased with the fact of people worshiping and that's simply not the case. May I bring to your attention uh, the story of Nadab and Abihu, for example. It says, the Bible tells us that Nadab and Abihu offered up a strange fire unto the Lord. Were they worshiping? Absolutely. But were they worshiping the right way? No, they were not. And what happened to Nadab and Abihu? Well, you know the story. They died. Not all worship is good worship. There's a right way to worship, and there's a wrong way to worship. We should worship in a way that praises, in a way that glorifies God. Nine ways, nine reasons to praise God in our worship. Number one, coming from Psalm 147. Hopefully you're there already. Psalm 147. Man, I love this psalm. Reason number one is the effect that it has on us. Look with me in verse 1. Psalm 147. It says, Praise the Lord. Isn't that a good way to start the book, the, the chapter, Psalm 147? Praise the Lord, for it is good to sing praises to our God, for it is pleasant and praise is becoming. You know, there's a little three-letter word there that occurs twice in verse 1. 
In the New Testament, when we see that three-letter word for, it is the Greek word gar. The word means let me tell you why. The same applies here in the New Testament. When you see praise the Lord for, it says let me tell you why you should praise the Lord in verse 1. Let me tell you why, that word for. Because it is good to sing praises to our God. Praise the Lord. Let me tell you why. Because it's a good thing to praise. It's a good thing to sing praises to our God. Let me tell you why. That word appears again in verse 1. He says, let me tell you why it is a good thing to sing praises to our God. He says, because or for it is pleasant and praise is becoming. How many of you have ever come to worship and you had a lot on your mind and the world has been dragging you down and you were discouraged, you were tired and you left excited and you left joyful and you left happy. That's what worship should do to the disciple. We should empty ourselves in the way that we worship and give God everything that we have but we should always leave joy, uh, full of joy, happiness. You notice the word good you notice the word pleasant. That's an interesting choice of word there. For it is good to sing praises to our God, for it is pleasant. Now why do we worship? Well, of course, worship is not intended for you and I. We don't worship for us. We worship to praise and to glorify God, do we not? Worship is not about us, I would agree. But isn't it interesting that a man inspired by the Holy Spirit, inspired by God, writes that worship is pleasant. Do you feel that way today? That worship is pleasant. There's just something that worship does to a person when they really worship the right way. Worship just does something to me that nothing else can. In those moments when I get to tell my God how much I love Him, when He's shown me over and over again how much He loves me, and those moments when I get to sing to Him, and those moments when I get to pray to Him, when I get to directly between He and I, when I get to say, God, I love You, God, I thank You, God, I praise You, that just does something to my heart. That just does something to my spirit. It gets me fired up. It gets me excited. It gets me ready to go back into the world and tell people how much Jesus loves them. Every time. There's just something that worship does to a person. Worship is pleasant. Second reason, because of the concern that He has for us. Let's look in verses 2 and 3. It says, The Lord builds up Jerusalem. He gathers the outcasts of Israel. He heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. This is a question I've pondered so often. Is why does God really have concern for me? I mean, think about all that God has done up to this point and all that God has created. Why me specifically does God care for? Why me specifically? Nearly 8 billion people in the world and the God of almost 8 billion people cares for me specifically and He's concerned about me specifically. Well, of course, we know it's because He loves us. But the concern that He has for us. Notice in verse 2 it says that He gathers the outcasts of Israel. Boy, that's another interesting word. The word outcast. There are people, and I know there are some here today in the audience that consider themselves an outcast. It's like they're different. They're not like everyone else. They feel like they're an outcast. Let me tell you something. For those of you who feel like you are an outcast... God loves you. It says that He gathers the outcasts of Israel. And then, in verse 3, He heals the brokenhearted. I know there are those in the audience today that feel like they would put themselves in this category, that I'm brokenhearted. Maybe you feel like you're both. Maybe you feel like an outcast. Maybe you feel like you're brokenhearted. God is concerned about you today. He loves you. He's thinking about you. Isn't that an amazing thing to think about? The God who created heaven and earth. The God who has put before us all of the beautiful things that we get to witness and enjoy every single day. That very same God loves and cares for you specifically. 
It's a very interesting thought. God is concerned for you specifically. And because God is concerned about us, that should stir us to want to be a people of praise in our worship. Third reason to praise God in our worship today is the attention that He pays to His creation. In verse 4, it says, He counts the number of the stars. He gives names to all of them. One of the reasons I love the book of Psalms is because Psalms is always painting a picture in my mind. I'm hoping it does the same for you. It's always trying to paint a picture of our God. It's always trying to paint a picture of all that's going on. And when I read this, when I read the fact that He counts the number of the stars, well, how many stars are there? Don't ask me. I could not tell you. Don't ask anyone because no one really knows. There's too many to count. God has created far more than, than we could ever count. It says that He counts the number of the stars and He gives names to them all. The fact that God pays attention to His creation. It's another really, really interesting thought. God in all His glory pays attention to that which He created. Reason number four. The very nature of that God possesses should make you want to praise God in our worship. In verse 5, it says, Great is our Lord. Man, isn't that a great statement? Great is our Lord and abundant in strength. His understanding is infinite. Now, I know I've spoke about this before, but every time I have the opportunity to do it again, I'm going to do it. The fact that God is both omnipotent, that He is omnipresent, that God is everywhere at once, that God is not bound by our human limitations. There are just certain things that you and I cannot do. Nate Robinson won the slam dunk contest in the NBA three times. He was credited for having nearly a 50-inch vertical at certain points in his career. That's outstanding. Nearly a 50-inch vertical. It's outstanding. He could really, really jump. My dad's very favorite f player of all time in any sport, Bo Jackson, was credited for one time running uh, a 4.1 to 40 yard dash. Isn't that incredible? That's fast. That's really fast. There are people that can jump really, really high. There are people that can run really, really fast. There are people who can do some outstanding things. But one way or another, we are still bound by human limitations. Some of you are saying I'm feeling some of them right now. We're bound by human limitations. But our God is not. He holds, He, can, he counts the stars. He's able to hold up the weight of the whole world. God can measure. The book of Psalms also tells us to measure the entire length of the entire universe from a span. That is the tip of His fingertip to His shoulder. He can measure the entire span of the universe. Our God is not bound by our human limitations. The very nature of God. The fact that He is so incredible. The fact that He is so great. Can you look forward to heaven when you get to see your God? When you get to look Him in the eyes? When you get to see in His glorified state the risen Savior Jesus Christ? Can you look forward to that day? I do. I look forward to that day. Our God is so great and the fact that He is all of these things, that He is omnipotent, that He is omniscient, that He is omnipresent, all of these things is reason enough for you to give Him everything that you have while you're here. If not, why not? The very nature of God is enough to make me say, God, I'm ready to give you everything that I have because you are so incredible. Reason number five is the fairness and justice that He demonstrates. In verse six it says, The Lord supports the afflicted. He brings down the wicked to the ground. Something we talk about often is that people feel like the God of the Old Testament and the God of the New Testament are two different gods. Like God somehow, over the course of that, that span of 400 plus years in between the Testaments, that somehow or another, God had a change of heart and that He, he was different in the New Testament. 
That God of the Old Testament was mean, he was cruel, he was vicious, he was violent, he was a murderer. I've heard all of these things said about our God in the Old Testament. And as Curtis pointed out, I believe it was Wednesday night actually, he pointed out the fact that God is never changing, that God is everlasting, that God is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow, and forever. God will never change. But when I think about God, and when I think about His actions in the Old Testament, I think about the fact that He did destroy cities. I think about the, the fact that God did allow His people to be taken into captivity multiple times. People look at that and they say, that God of the Old Testament was, was cruel, He was violent. But ask yourself this question, was His action justified? Was He justified in His actions? Can you justify what God did in the Old Testament? Sure you can. Sure you can. Can you imagine pouring out everything that you have into a group of people and over and over and over again they disobey you, they spit in your, they spit in your face and they reject you over and over and over again? Was God justified in His action? Sure He was. Sure He was. You know, there are people today that think that you should never spank your kids. Well, let me tell you, if I never got spanked when I was a kid, goodness knows what I'd be like today. Were my parents justified in spanking my butt when I was acting like a little brat? Sure they were. I deserved it. I was a brat sometimes. They had every reason in the world to bend me over the bed and to wear me out. Every reason in the world to do so. God's action was justified. Did God have reason for doing what He did in the Old Testament? Sure He did. Does God have reason for doing what He does even carrying into the New Testament with those who don't obey Him? Sure He does. He is God. He, again, is the one that is far above and beyond what we are. Who are we to set and to think that something that God does isn't fair? If God was really fair in our minds, if we really got what we deserved, goodness, I think it's so interesting that people often demand justice. Have you been noticing that theme in our society lately with all of the craziness that's been going on uh, and all the different protests, all of the stuff going on? And people say, well, this person or this group deserves justice. Something happens and a person says, this person deserves nothing less than to be executed for their action. This is justice. I think it's so funny that the very same people who demand justice are the very same people that when they stand before God on Judgment Day will not be asking for justice. Just let me tell you. The very people who demand justice are the very same people that are going to cower down before God on Judgment Day and are going to beg for what? For justice? Of course not. For mercy. For mercy. For grace. The fairness and the justice that God demonstrates. The fact that for those who call on the name of the Lord Jesus, you know, we make Christianity, we make New Testament uh, discipleship, we make it tougher than it has to be. So often some people get to the end of their life and they wonder, have I done enough? I'm just not sure. And that's never the goal of God for your life. The goal is for you to know the salvation that you have. Why can we be confident in our salvation? We can be confident in our salvation because of the blood of Christ. Going back to the book of Galatians, love the book of Galatians. Almost the entire book is written to a group of people who don't understand the relationship between law and grace. They still had it in their mind that I have to earn my salvation. That I have to work my way into heaven. And it's just not that way. We are a group of people who rely totally upon the grace of God, nothing more, nothing less. Now granted, out of our love for God, and as a result of His love for us, there are certain things that we do, and there are certain things that we do not do. I don't argue that at all. We can't live however we want and still be saved. However, we are a group of people who rely totally on grace. And the fairness of the justice, who God is, and the way He goes about dealing with His people is enough to say, God, I want to praise You because I don't deserve You. Reason number six. The way He sustains the earth, starting in verse 7. It says, Sing to the Lord with thanksgiving. Sing praises to our God on the lyre who covers the heavens with clouds, who provides rain for the earth, who makes grass to grow on the mountains. 
He gives to the beast its food and to the young ravens which cry, and does not delight in the strength of the horse. He does not take pleasure in the legs of a man. The Lord favors those who fear Him, those who wait for His loving kindness. Let's go on to verse 15. It says, He sends forth His command to the earth. His word runs very swiftly. He gives snow like wool. He scatters the frost like ashes. He casts forth His ice as fragments. Who can stand before His cold? He sends forth His word and melts them. He causes His wind to blow and the waters to flow. Isn't it amazing that God is able to sustain life in a world as big as ours with nearly 8 billion people living in it? And I shared with you some statistics here a while back about percentages of water that God uses. And we came to the conclusion that from about 1% of all water found on the face of the earth, about 1% God is able to sustain life for nearly 8 billion people. And we talked about how amazing that was. The same is true today. It's amazing that God can sustain life on an earth using only about 1% of its water. It's fantastic. Think about the water cycle in and of itself. Isn't that amazing what God is able to do and the way He's able to sustain the earth? So many things that God does that are so beyond what I could imagine. The way that God takes care of the earth, the way He goes about watering it, the way that He goes about things is enough to make me want to praise God on Sunday morning, Sunday night, and come back to learn more about Him on Wednesday night. Number seven. The reason number seven to praise God and worship is the favor that He shows His followers. Starting in verse 11, it says, The Lord favored those who fear Him. Now let's stop right there for a moment. I've done this before. I want you to say this with me. Okay? I'll say it first and then you repeat after me. The Lord favors those who fear Him. Here we go. The Lord favors those who fear Him. One more time. The Lord favors those who fear Him. Okay? Please don't forget that statement. The Lord favors those who fear Him. That's enough to make me want to praise God. Do I deserve favor? Of course not. Of course not. You know, when it comes to preaching, the idea of ministry, I fought this for a long, long, long time. Ministry is probably the very last thing I ever saw myself doing. To be honest with you, for a long time I wanted to, uh, I was going to pursue baseball as long as I could. And then when that didn't work out, I wanted to move to Wyoming North Dakota, somewhere up there. Probably Wyoming was my first choice. And I wanted to ranch. I wanted to do cowboy the rest of my life. Until I was old, crepid, couldn't get out of bed in the morning, and then I'd let somebody else do it. That was my plan. That's what I wanted to do with my life. I wanted to move away from everyone and everything and ranch the rest of my life. There was a time maybe I wanted to go professional and fishing. I've had several ideas. But none of them ever involved ministry. This is the very last thing I ever saw myself doing. In fact, the very first time that somebody ever said, Chase, why don't you preach a sermon sometime? It scared me to death. And I said, you will never in a million years talk me into getting up there and preaching a sermon. I can remember that conversation. The woman is still alive today uh, that, that, that uh, I had that conversation with several years ago. And we've talked about it from time to time. I say, Miss Martin, do you remember the time that you asked me to preach a sermon for the very first time and I said, you will never, ever, ever talk me into it? And she says, yeah, I do. She was persistent. And she got me to do it. And I loved it. I show up to preach my very first sermon and my entire baseball team is there. It was an amazing opportunity for me. It was an amazing moment. And from that moment on, I knew that preaching was something that I had potential in. But after about two years of that, I still thought, ah, I still don't think this is what I want to do for the rest of my life. Think about this. Even my first year of college, my first year of college, I went and was studying something else agriculturally uh, related to agriculture because I still had this thought in the back of my mind, is this really what I want to do for the rest of my life? I fought it, and I fought it, and I fought it. And a lot of the reason, I say all of that to say this, a lot of the reason I fought it for so long was because I asked myself this question, how in the world am I ever going to be able to stand before a congregation of the Lord's people 
and preach knowing how unworthy I am? And I fought that question for so long. How in the world am I ever going to be able to stand up there before God's people and preach the word of God of which I am so unworthy and undeserving to preach? I still struggle with that from time to time. I don't know a minister who doesn't. I feel so unworthy every time that I stand before you and get to do what I do. But the fact that God shows favor to me, an undeserving person, the fact that He has blessed me with a home, the fact that He has blessed me with a congregation who loves me, the fact that He has blessed me with a wife who I have prayed for for so long and who my parents have been praying for all my life, the fact that He has shown me over and over and over again His favor, and the fact that He's shown me how much He loves me over and over again, I do not deserve the life that I have. And I think if you examine your life, you'll say the same. I do not deserve the life that I have. And the very fact that God has blessed me when I don't deserve it over and over again is enough for me to walk in the doors of the church building on a Sunday morning fired up because I get to say, God, thank you for the life that I don't deserve. The favor that He shows His followers should serve as motivation. Number eight, the word that He has declared to us in verse 19, he declares his words to Jacob, his statutes, and his ordinances to Israel. You know, God's word does something to you, doesn't it? We talked about how worship should do something to you. What does God's word do to you? The fact that God has given us his word, the fact that we have this, this, this God-breathed book, a book that's unlike any other book, the idea that God commands us to be a people of praise during worship really should be enough, should it not? You know, again, I've said this before, but growing up when my parents would tell me to do something, and of course, me being a snot-nosed brat, what would I say? I'd say, well, why? And they would say, because I said so. And that answer was never sufficient for me, of course, as a child. Never was that sufficient for me because you said so. But in all seriousness, God, if He says to do something, shouldn't we do it just because He says so? Absolutely. Just because God in His Word has commanded us to do all that He's commanded us to do, being who He is, that's really, in essence, enough for us to do it. We could use this one reason, skip the other, uh, skip the other eight reasons, and that should be enough. You should do what God has told you to do because God has told you to do it. It's all about obedience to Him. Final reason, number nine, <clears throat> is the covenant that He has made with His children. In verse 20, it says, He has not dealt thus with any nation. As for His ordinances, they have not known them. Praise the Lord. Well, there's a really strong way to end this chapter. He has not dealt thus with any nation. As for His ordinances, they have not known them. Praise the Lord. Do you know what he's saying? Essentially, the fact that God has laid out a plan for His people, He's laid out the law, and His people are not doing it. They're just not following it. But God has not dealt the way that He should, the way that we deserve with His people. And because of that, in verse 20, He says, Praise the Lord. You know what a covenant is? A covenant, in essentially, essentially, in essence, is a promise. On the day that you and I were immersed into Christ Jesus, we made a covenant with Him. We made a two-way promise. We promised God on that day that we were going to live a life of faithfulness to Him. And in return, God promised us that He would be our God, that He would be with us, that He would protect us, that He would guide us. And then on that day, we could stand before Him with confidence, knowing that we have our salvation. A covenant is a two-way agreement. It's a two-way promise. God made covenants, uh, established covenants with His people all through the Bible. I think about the covenant that He established with Abraham, and then the, the covenant that He established just a generation later with His Son. I think about the covenant that God established with Israel. God talks about that covenant with Israel over and over again, saying that they have broken the covenant. They have disobeyed the covenant, the promise that they made to me. But the fact that God has promised you all that He has is enough to make you want to praise God in your worship today. 
So because of the concern that He has for us, because of the effect that praising God has on us, because of the attention He prays to His creation, because of the nature that He possesses, because of the fairness and the justice that is in Him, because of the way that He sustains the earth, because of the favor that He shows His followers, uh, because of the word that He has declared to us, and because of the covenant that He has made for us, we should praise Him with everything that we have. I appreciate your attention this morning. I hope you go back and read Psalm 147. There's lots of stuff. I wish that we had more time to dig a little deeper. Some of you are saying, thank goodness you don't have more time. I wish we did. But I appreciate your attention so very much. Uh, come back tonight at 6 o'clock. We're going to be talking about what it means to be a servant. And there are some things there that you do not want to miss. And at this time, we offer up a song of invitation. We want to pray for you. We want to pray with you. If you're outside of Christ and you need to do something about it, and we can help you, we can take you right up here. We can immerse you into Christ Jesus. You can start your covenant relationship with Him this morning. Whatever your need, please come. Do it now as we stand. And do it now. As